So thank you, Boris and Lyubsko, for inviting me. Uh, this talk is a little bit probably different than what you expected. It's not a technical talk, although it is in the technical session. And maybe it has got more in common with the ones we saw yesterday. Um, so what I would like to think about is uh, reflect on some of the things that, that happened in the last year in my field that have made uh, uh, headlines in the news. And uh, we actually see a lot of artificial intelligence and big data featured in in the media these days, and uh, one big story has been the one about fake news. So it was all over the newspapers, the idea that uh, fake news somehow affected public opinion, and there were endless calls for finding some technical solution, and there are research projects, and so on. And this is, if you haven't seen it, how fake news look like. They actually are little news items with slightly um, unusual URLs, perhaps. And the only difference is the news they give are not factual, they're not real. But other than that, they've been seen millions of times. In this one in particular, they've been seen many, many times. A few months ago, we found out that a, a firm called Cambridge Analytica started, a, um, a, was part of the campaign for Brexit and for Trump, and they were making use of propaganda techniques that are new. And based on psychological profiles of users, they were able to target ads in a more effective way. Um, and they took credit, incredibly enough, for, for Trump's success. And again, this year we found out that uh, many states in the US uh, are using software as part of court decisions about releasing prisoners on parole. And that also create a little scandal because uh, this software was tested and people saw that perhaps it wasn't as unbiased as advertised. Last year, the insurance company Admiral deployed uh, a, a method to choose uh, your insurance rates based on your Facebook content. It was quickly withdrawn, not because it isn't working, but because Facebook didn't like the publicity that came from it. And then, of course, we are still trying to figure out this other older story, the surveillance story. And the question is, what is going on? How come all this is happening now? And the journalists and the media, and I get a lot of calls from journalists, they try to understand what's happening and how many strange coincidences are bringing machine learning to the news. Because all these things are about big data and machine learning. And the answer is, these are not coincidences. This is not a random moment in which, by chance, six or seven things happen at the same time. And so I thought I would spend some time reflecting on what is happening today. Why are we seeing all this? And what can we see next? So the short answer is nothing new is happening. This is actually a very old story that we've seen over and over again, just with new technology. Um, by the way, I will be skipping slides because I made too many. So if you see something passing fast, ignore it. Uh, two different technologies have converged or are converging. One is the emergence of one single global unified data infrastructure over the past 20 years. And the other one is a major paradigm shift in artificial intelligence, again, in the last 20 years. These two things are converging and they are behind what we see. So if, 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 uh, if you're not too young, you will remember the days when we had separate communication media. We had telephones and mail, banking and television, radio and newspapers and shopping, and everything was a different part of our society, separated. And, uh, but they've been converging incredibly fast. So a child today will not really know why they have different names. These are all different apps on the same iPad. And they just do the telephone, the mail, the banking, the shopping, the TV, the entertainment. It's the same medium. The convergence happened uh, in a sort of spontaneous way, initially. Um, and uh, it disrupted a lot of the business models we had back then. In fact, it was hailed as a major positive disruption. 
customers started buying from producers directly. Artists could sell their music directly to users. Uh, the newspapers were completely disrupted. Their business model is gone. You can get the news for free directly from the journalist or from the blogger. Advertising was the first industry to be completely transformed by direct automatic ads given by Google. And now, at some point, people acquire the capability of broadcasting a video, publishing a book or an article. Just think about the world, the world I remember, and many of you may remember. How could you, in the 80s, broadcast a video? I remember when the first private radio was allowed in Italy. It was the mid-70s. And then the private TV came in the, mid in the late 80s. We thought this would be a revolution. We had the telephone company, the TV company, the radio company, state-run. And we thought, finally, somebody is breaking the monopoly of the mediators. It was called by some observers disintermediation. You disintermediate. You remove the key gatekeepers. And you start this new world. So the promise was one of disintermediation. And you could see the obvious power shift that would follow from that. In that world of the 80s, I remember it was so hard to communicate or do business without the gatekeepers. People really suffered. We had a comedian in Italy who, who said something wrong about the wrong party on live TV, and he never worked again. Out. This was it. In fact, he's part of the story because he hasn't disappeared yet. So the idea of not needing gatekeepers was powerful. It was behind the dream of the early years of the web. Here is an example. Expedia allows you to buy your tickets, not have an agency. Google News gives you the news, no human editors. So these are examples of social machines. Social machines are a mix of software and many users coming together, interacting, and uh, joining forces. You can consider, of course, Wikipedia. I mean, if you think about it, in the 1990s, an encyclopedia was written by thousands of people who never met each other. Again, try and explain this to somebody in the 70s, that one day somebody will write an encyclopedia in that way. And you can use eBay. I know people in, um, in the um, um, pawn shops, like if you are next to a casino, you want to give your watch for some money, they will check the value of items by going on eBay and finding out what is the, the going price. eBay is a great way to aggregate knowledge from everybody to find out prices. Amazon, Reddit is for opinions. Um, and then, after that, Facebook was created, 2004. Twitter was created, iPhone, iPad. And all of these words we give for granted today, the hashtag, the follower, the trending thing, these are all in the last 15 years. Facebook today has 2 billion users. So it's easy to forget how quickly this transformation went. And this is not a transformation in the sense of changing the heating system or the steam engine, which is remarkable. This is a mass communication medium. So anybody familiar with McLuhan would know media are not neutral. Media, by structure, have their own agenda, so to speak. And that is a, being a major media transformation that we witnessed in our lifetime. And meanwhile, at the same time, artificial intelligence was undergoing its own revolution. By the mid-90s, we all could see that the traditional way wasn't going to work after many years of time. That was visible. And uh, we didn't have translation and speech recognition and image classification, despite endless investment by the state, by the military normally, but states, some industries. The idea of logical reasoning hasn't worked. Statistical methods emerged, and the combination of statistical machine learning with vast amounts of data somehow made it work. We called it data-driven AI, and that was how we suggested books to buyers, how we stopped spam, ranked web pages and checked spelling, and all the early applications of machine learning on the web came from statistics. And now we translate and speak to Siri, and everything else, still statistical pattern recognition. That is what happened. And the key observation there was that we don't need to fully understand a behavior that we want to reproduce. 
We just need to have enough examples, enough data, and the machine can guess better than random, often much better than random, what will be the right action. The next word, if you're typing, the next product, if you're recommending, the next article you may want to read, or the email you want to discard. Just very simple statistical predictions based on data. And so we came to realize that people, you know, like data and they call it the new oil. And the analogy they use is if the algorithm, if the AI was a car, you know, they say the engine is the algorithm, but the fuel is the data. You, you, you don't go anywhere without your data. And there was, everything was summarized in a great article in 2010, The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Data by Peter Norvig and Fernando Pereira and others, where all this manifesto was spelled out. And so we came to live in this new world, a new world where data matters more than models. And uh, understanding wasn't a key goal. And we could just create intelligent behavior by training learning algorithms, which was great for me because I was doing machine learning. And uh, the language spoken by AI today is the language of statistics and control theory and game theory, which is the language we spoken here yesterday, today. And so we are here with this new strange mass medium that is an interconnected global data infrastructure that allows you to get any data and share any data and gather data in a single unified way with a new type of AI. And so all this hype followed. And the last few years were a good example of hype uh, about data. Now I lost track of time. Uh, Boris, can you signal me when there is a midpoint? Oh, sorry, yes. Just sorry, no. Okay. Yeah, I will, I will keep an eye on my timing. So all this could be seen as another way of bypassing, you know, by, not bypassing the gatekeepers and the, and the mediators. Now we are bypassing even the modeling and the understanding. Uh, as machine learners, we, we realized that uh, whatever Ada Lovelace told us wasn't true. You know, she's famous for saying computers can only do exactly what they've been instructed to do. Well, if you go to DeepMind, nobody can beat their own program at Go. Machines can do stuff no programmer can do. Uh, you bypass so many fundamental steps by you know, relinquishing control and uh, putting the machine in, in that control position, sorry. So if you think about intelligent agents as just general purpose agents that pursue their goals in a complex environment, as always, then you don't have to think about, do they really think? Are they really intelligent? You know, you build a system that is autonomous. Amazon is autonomous. Google, Facebook are very autonomous in many of the things they do. Um, so that is what is today artificial intelligence. It lives on the web. It has access to enormous amounts of data because all this data flowing to the one infrastructure is easily available to the software. And uh, it can take actions. Cars can be driven, answer, questions can be answered, translation, and so on. Now, that's all good. Except we heard a lot of <coughs> people claiming that we can take this further, above and beyond any engineering application. These ideas have been counted as more general than just engineering hacks. And so people have been uh, talking about the end of theory. We don't need theories anymore. We just need correlations and so on. Um, and that is part of what we start seeing now, people taking things further than they were meant to be. Still, we have an infrastructure, we have a data, we have, an, we, have, we have AI. We can speak with each other for free. We can do business. We can do incredible amount of things for free. So that's all good. And now this is interesting, this feedback loop. AI enables the infrastructure to work because it directs traffic. It creates engagement. It uh, models users. Without AI, spam would just block you. You couldn't use YouTube because the amount of videos in it would be too much for you to use. YouTube can only exist because recommendations and search engines exist. Banking transactions online can only exist because further detection systems exist. Email is only meaningful because you can block spam. And Google 
is only meaningful because it can quickly sort out all attempts to spam it. So AI enables the infrastructure, the infrastructure enables AI, and they feed onto each other and they accelerate. And the AI community, the machine learning community, has been part of building this. So, you know, we, it's quite something. Many, many thousands of people, of course. So, all good. End of the talk. Well, no. Unless you are a travel agent and a bookseller and a translator, a journalist, a publisher, and taxi driver, a bus driver, a postman, you should be happy. The list goes on. But there are a couple of things. First, this is something about people, not about machines. You know, people. People got carried away. We saw these kind of articles, the end of science as we know it. Machines will take over science. Theories are not needed. Here on the left, you know, data-based medicine, the end of evidence-based medicine, question mark. And uh, this is just a small selection. People want to replace judges, doctors, teachers, policemen, journalists. Let's disintermediate everything. Anybody who has any power can be replaced by a piece of software and let's enjoy the, the freedom. That is what you start reading in some extreme circles. Well, so that's part of the problem, right? And there is something else about people. If every single piece of communication and data goes to the same infrastructure, guess what happens? The next day, somebody will think, well, you know, we can use that. We can use that. We can monitor, can monitor it. We can uh, do surveillance. What was impossible before, extensive automatic mass surveillance, which was very expensive before, now it's feasible. You just do it. Right? They just do it. And, um, and then something else about people. Of course, companies exist whose only business is to collect and aggregate data about people and resell it. They're called data brokers. And so now we built this thing, and we felt quite proud, and we felt quite happy, and we got rid of a bunch of powerful people, and we replaced them with a much more democratic, direct way of doing things. And now we realize that, uh, well, somebody started collecting data about you and sell it. Somebody is collecting it, not for selling it, just for watching. And um, somebody starts arguing that uh, we don't need any more uh, expertise because machines will replace the need for expertise. And these are, you know, not surprising. People have tried this for a long time. And this new medium is not the same as a copper cable linking to telegraphs. This medium can uh, understand its content. Uh, it can stop some and uh, recommend others. It can look back at you because it wants to know what you may want to do next. This is not a telephone. This is not a radio. This is a new thing. It remembers everything. And its business model means it has got its own goals. It has to have its own goals to fund itself. So when you deal with Facebook and you know, Google and Amazon, you're not dealing with a new type of telegraph. So, Personalization, today we heard about it, it's a great idea. Personalization was another big hype in the last few years. The system we are building has to constantly refine its models of your goals and intents and, uh, and uh, interests, of course, to personalize its offer. And this is, I think, a great scientific discovery we made, that it is possible to predict people's behavior better than random, at least, by having enough data. So that's something that we couldn't claim 20 years ago. Well, if you have enough data, if you can observe a person for long enough, you can predict what they will buy. How about predicting what they will type, perhaps, what they will eat? How about school performance, perhaps? How about health risk? I'm sure you can. How about crime risk? Well, people try. That's quite new. And let's think about people, but engineers in particular. You know, we like to take things to the extreme. Let's see how far we can push it. That's, again, not new. People have been trying to predict credit ratings, driving risk, health risk, based on your social media postings. Predict your future risk of reoffending based on information they gather from questionnaires. Predicting voting intentions based on your social media footprint. We can do it. Let's say we can do it. Does this mean that we should? 
So that is where we start having some interesting questions that maybe engineers aren't the right people for. Should we? Um, so one question is, what happens to society if everybody is receiving their news based on an algorithm whose exact goal is to maximize click-through? The algorithm, if it's designed well, it will probably maximize click-through. It will just find the one items that people can't resist and recommend it. It will achieve its one goal to maximize traffic. It turns out that you like to read things, to click on things, that, you, that are similar to what you clicked yesterday. And you like to click on things that are similar to what your friends clicked on. So that creates a lot of redundancy. You will see more and more and more of what you seen yesterday and what your friends have just seen. How does this affect public opinion? I can't complain. We built it, we deployed it, it's doing what we did it, told it to do. Well, it turns out the public opinion is very much affected by what it reads, what people read. So this is, for, this is a company in England recommending food, trying to guess what you want to eat tomorrow and just shipping it to you before. How about news? Um, and so we have this interesting situation. There is more besides, you know, the, the impact on public opinion of recommendations. There is much more. Psychometrics, another big disintermediation we can do. Instead of the science of uh, psychometrics, where you try to infer latent psychological traits in people from testing them, from observing them, some people discovered that you can actually do a lot just by analyzing what they post and what they like and what they click online. Sounds crazy, but it's not more crazy than predicting the next word you will type or the next email you will not want to read. It's too different. It's still in inferring latent psychological quantities. And so somebody invented a system called uh, uh, My Personality. It was a funny game online. 58,000 people took the test that gave the training data to the company. The company traded the model, and they were able to show that uh, you can predict the five key personality dimensions very well based on social media activities, likes, posts, and so on. And so it was not surprising when Admiral, the insurance company, proposed, let's use this information to give you discounts. If you are a safe type of person, you get a discount. Everything seems to be sensible. But then you think again, well, these people were posting stuff online and liking things online. Maybe they were underage. Did they know they were going to affect their future credit opportunities or insurance rates? Probably not. Is the thing working for real? You know? How about predicting IQ? Can employers use psychometrically inferred quantities from the web when they recruit you? Is it acceptable? We don't know. We don't know. But the point is, ma machine learning is doing what it was meant to do. It's bypassing complex modeling by finding a statistical shortcut based on data. If you give me 58,000 people's uh, psychological tests and their output, and if I can make a machine learning thing in between, well, somebody will use it. Dynamic pricing is bigger than just insurance. You can choose prices for other things. How much will this person be prepared to pay? Let's predict that. Let's charge him just one penny less. Why not? Why not? So these things are possible. So the, the concern is really quite philosophical. Freedom of speech, on the one hand, should allow you to speak your mind without paying a cost for it. And technology allows people to use that information, to play a game against you. That is a question that somebody has to address. I'm a big fan of uh, an idealized notion of politicians who understand this and can, and can, and can take care of this. Liberty. People are using, not only in the US, by the way, also in the UK, software to decide about releasing prisoners. You know, you ask them 137 questions, and you use these questions to train a model and decide what is the risk of reoffending. That's fair enough. How long will it take before somebody says, we shouldn't ask 137 questions? We can just plug in their Twitter feed. I mean, somebody will propose it at some point. Convergence is the one constant in all this business. How about steering public opinion? 
this is not just a Trump thing. This started way before. Even the first Obama campaign wasn't new, but the first Obama campaign made exhaustive use of marketing data from the data brokers, and they, had, they made use of individual features, as they reported. So you buy the list of all the voters, the list of all the purchases they've done, the list of the past credit history, and then you complete it with some telephone calls to put labels. Machine learning can identify swing voters in those days. Now you can add to it personality information, find the people who are likely to change their mind, and that is what Cambridge Analytica cl claimed they've done it in, in the last election cycle. So it isn't new what they've done. They added five more features to the rest. You can do it. Let's say we can do it. Should we do it? Should we have a list of people and the prediction of what they might vote for and then send somebody to their home, knock on their door? I don't know. But I would like somebody to ask this question. Maybe, you know, maybe Cambridge Analytica and the other companies are just hyping up their product and kind of selling it bigger than it is. Let's say they cannot do it. Well, somebody else next year may be able to do it. We still have to think about it. So, nudging, recommending, micro-targeting, rewarding people, these are all ways to shape users' behavior. So this new infrastructure we built, with artificial intelligence in it, can monitor, can predict, can steer. These are new powers we give it. Now, I need to skip a bit. And here is my point about disintermediation. We felt very proud. We got rid of middlemen and gatekeepers. But we find out in 2017 that we actually replaced those with algorithms. We didn't remove them. We replaced them, as it always happens with gatekeepers and middlemen. Our little revolution gave us just another round of the same, just these are machines. And they decide what you read what you can sell, what is the price, how many followers you can get. That's managed by a machine. But we don't have any more the journalists and the editors. A lot of these recommendations are done by machine. So if I put a fake story, there is no human anywhere between me and the ultimate user. If you ask, block fake news, not so easy without humans in the loop. And humans were the, pa the point of removing. Removing the humans was the point. And now we find it's very hard to run a newspaper without humans. So, this is my point about the new gatekeepers. We have put algorithms in a position of being sometimes gatekeepers. More may come if we don't think hard. So, I'm not against, of course, I make my living out of building intelligent algorithms. I want to continue. I am a big user of the web. I'm not going to stop. And, but let's, let's reflect about 2017 because there may be more in 2018 and 19 and 20, and we can still fix it. Now, personalization. Let's consider this notion. Having a computer, building a model of a person and their needs and wishes and wants and health for the purpose, you know, maybe of helping them with school, maybe with health. How can this information be also used? Because this is the, the syllogism. If it's legal and technically possible and profitable, somebody will do it. So my advice is let's make it not legal, for example, or not profitable. And what do you do as a person or your child in the future if they are denied a loan or parole or a job because an algorithm decided that they are not suitable? To whom do they complain? To whom do they ask for explanations? How do they handle that? You get very complex, deep networks saying no loan, and no job, and no, no university for you. Why? Well, you know, the score. So that's something we can still reflect about. So let's realize, progress was amazing, AI is amazing, we did it, we deployed it, we use it. It can monitor, predict, and steer. Now, let's reflect about it a little bit. What's next? The Internet of Things. People keep on pushing this on us. The Internet of Things literally means if I turn off the lights in this room, I don't just walk there and press the button. I tell my smartphone to turn off the lights in this room. That is the point of the Internet of Things. 
So somebody's in between mediating my switch off. Could be Google, could be Nest, whatever company is in charge of deploying the system here. They keep the data. Uh, it's great, you know, toaster, kettle, fridge. You know, you access them to the internet. You are in the presence of the kettle and the toaster, but you still operate it through the smartphone. Okay, so if somebody can predict your health based on tweets and Facebook, maybe they can use that too. So let us understand the signals will grow more and more. Signals are features we give up, information we give up. And then, what's coming further than that? People are advocating the notion of social regulation by algorithms. There are very many articles advocating that. Let us deploy feedback loops in society to regulate society, to reward and perhaps uh, disincentive people uh, for behaviors that are to be rewarded or not rewarded by algorithm. So you see this, Tim O'Reilly is one of them, but there are many of them. So that is not so different, they say, from what's happening to the Uber drivers or the Amazon warehouse workers. That's what they do. They are monitored by algorithms. And that is an interesting new place for us. People working below an API. The software decides that the driver A will take passenger B from C to D. You know, the algorithm calls the, to the API a person. Let's say you want a pizza or you want a drive, a ride. You can do it. There are APIs for that. You want somebody to label your data. There are APIs for that. You want somebody to do some task. You don't have to have a software. You have an API that will ask somebody to do it for you. These are task workers, and they're organized by a middle layer that is no longer humans. Yes, the, the owners are humans, the drivers are humans, and the middle layer is the software. So much for the disintermediation, right? There is a software middle layer now. And, uh, and by the way, people below the API are the next ones who are going to have to compete with machines for their salary because automatic cars and other things can be trained, literally, based on their, on their work. So this is the interesting side effect. And then, if you think for another second, how do you obtain this automatic social regulation people are advocating? Some people advocate the idea of scoring people, giving you points, just like Uber drivers and customers are scored. And I see uh, many colleagues advocating the idea that you can score every citizen based on their goodness, I don't know, social worth. And then you can use it to reward and sanction behaviors that are not approvable. So that is all, you know, it looks crazy. This is straight, open discussions taking place. So, on the one hand, human judges and managers and journalists are provably very, very flawed. On the other hand, algorithms are not much better. I don't think we are going to get away from this. It's, there is no magic recipe that you piece, put a piece of machinery and you solve this problem. Um, side effects that will follow from uh, algorithmic monitoring and regulation are not known. I hope we are going to find out before we deploy them. So these are cultural challenges that come from living in this AI world we have built. And then there is a general data ideology which is quite interestingly and concerning me because uh, there is a notion that if something is done by an algorithm based on data, it's more neutral, it's more effective, it's less biased, it's more honest. And that is actually very easy to disprove. There has been a lot of recent work, including one on science three months ago, showing that machines trained by modern AI will absorb the very same biases that we have from us. So, questions, right? So we have a, a social scientist, my group is a group of engineering, but we have two philosophers working with us. We are very serious about understanding what we can do um, about this. We want to continue developing the technology. We also want to sleep at night. I think it's necessary for us to take this seriously. We are still on time. Uh, automation is a positive. We must automate, but remember, uh, by the way, we can't go back because uh, we phased out everything else. There is no longer uh, the previous infrastructure we removed. We are stuck with this one. So here is the old story. It is not a new story. It's a grown-up world. Everything is a side effect. We should stop 
um, before we know. Forget that I, I've been typing. So uh, that's where I've gone so far. Thank you very much. Okay, questions? Tell me, please, what you think about uh, main logic in, uh, uh, in new uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, I know, and you say, uh, too, that uh, in old artificial intelligence, uh, logic was uh, including. Uh, now, in new artificial intelligence, we have some simple uh, kinds of logic in uh, algorithms, in intelligent agents. Uh, what do you think, uh, where is now and uh, uh, what will be uh, main logic in uh, artificial intelligence? So I understand that it's about, so you are asking about the role of logic in artificial intelligence, but I missed the, the key I think the, about the key part. Uh, main logic, you know, uh, simple uh, uh, logic uh, rules uh, now is in uh, intelligent agents, yeah. in algorithms, in actually artificial intelligence. What's happened with main logic? Main, you mean the normal traditional prologue type of AI? Which, which is main logic? I uh, never heard about main logic. <laughs> what is main logic? Okay, okay, okay. No, you mean just logic? Okay, okay. I can tell you something general. Uh, what do so, you think uh, uh, um, when, when some system uh, working automatically, that's, that's all what you explain, uh, work automatically, and uh, 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 where is uh, main idea? Where is uh, God of typical intelligence? God of intelligence? Yes. Well, um, Thank you. I hope I understood correctly, because uh, these are quite subtle things. Um, so my position about the role of logic in AI, I will clarify, and then we can talk about your question about the main idea behind AI. My position about the role of logic in AI is that one day we are going to need it again, in the sense that uh, So it is true that for the first 40 years, we were driven by this misunderstanding that the most intelligent thing we can do is to play chess and prove theorems. It turns out that was not at all an example of intelligence. It is something we can build. We built it. Um, I believe that intelligence evolved in, uh, in history before humans, before language, and before logic, and it was good for chickens to not be eaten by a fox. That really is the point of intelligence. So the idea that the mathematicians in Stanford decided the symbol of intelligent behavior is theorem proving, and they use this booklet by Polya to shape everything. It tells you a lot about mathematicians, really, not about intelligence. And uh, now we, we've gone past it. So it, it didn't work. We can do a lot of things by statistics. This doesn't mean that the reasoning is not necessary. It would be crazy to argue that we don't need reasoning. When I will ask a complicated question to Siri next year or in 10 years' time, Siri will reason about it. It will be a question that doesn't have a simple answer to be retrieved. It will be the result of reasoning and connecting many dots. I believe it will be a type of probabilistic reasoning. It will not be logic. And uh, I'm afraid that the traditional way of doing logic is not compatible with the real world. That's my personal impression. I hope so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can, uh, do you think it's possible that artificial intelligence, even though it's not based on, on logic or it's based on data, it could somehow help, uh, try to help to solve mathematical problems, which is a primary logic? Is, uh, is, is there some way that you, you would envision? Um, artificial intelligence, yeah, it is being used all the time. Everybody's using, I mean, that's, there is a lot of software out there to prove theorems and uh, 
How okay, do so, so create new theories, even create new mathematical theories or... Uh... Theories or theorems within the same theory? Within the same theory, it is done routinely, right? The, the, the deducing, deducing theorems from a set of axioms is done very well for a long time. Inventing new theories, I... Yeah, inventing new, new okay. That I don't know because, you know... So how far it can go in, in abstract thinking? Uh, so the question would be how far it can go in abstract thinking? I don't think there is a limit. I actually, I must confess, I don't believe that is a particularly useful or interesting problem because it doesn't change much in life. But I think it's a formal world, it's a mathematical world, it's the ideal place for machines to do what they do best. I, I wouldn't be surprised if machines could just... That is actually quite analogous to the recent success in Go and in chess. That is not a different type of domain. It's quite, it's quite a, a formal, clean doma domain. Yeah, but the, the success in Go is in, it's, it's not a rigorous, uh, rigorous uh, sequence, right? In mathematics, you, you have uh, rigorous proofs, and uh, that's different than what AlphaGo did. It's, uh, the way AlphaGo works, is by uh, doing the only sensible thing they can do. And I believe mathematicians do the same. Uh, nobody explores exhaustively every possible deduction of every possible combination of axioms. There is a notion of search. And AlphaGo has found a very good way to search. And the people do the same. I think that AlphaGo can help in that. But I'm not sure that it's exciting, but uh, proving theorems will not be the main legacy of AI, for sure. What's happening today is that we deploy the AI in the center of our life, of everybody's life, not the mathematician's life. Uh, everybody in this room today, from the time they woke up to now, have been using some artificial intelligence in the form of a search engine and Google Maps and a cache machine and a Facebook and a Twitter. We can't avoid it anymore and we don't know what it's doing to us. So the theorem proving is fine. Uh, my question uh, really aims a little bit on that. Uh, it, could it happen that human intelligence becomes totally obsolete? That's the, that's the question. Again, once more, I don't think it's impossible, but it will, it will not be because theorem proving is done by a machine. It will be for other reasons, uh, b because uh, there may be systems out there that have too many moving parts, too many moving variables for any human to comprehend. And uh, in time, machines can understand them better, like you know, managing air traffic or something. So that is possible. That is, that is why we build these things, ultimately, because there are domains where humans aren't very good. And uh, yeah, that, that's possible. But it will not be what you think, though. You will not have a conversation with it. You will build a very intelligent system. It will do amazing behaviors. It will probably outperform you in so many ways, but you still will not have a conversation with it. It will be something else. I'm very glad you just said that because that's exactly my question. So isn't the problem that you will not have a conversation with it? Isn't the problem that all the human decision making, and this is actually where I think logic is very important, but that aside, is that you can probe query and uh, judge in an interactive process those decisions, right? And, and a human decision maker has to come up, has to kind of dig deeper into contextual variables, into common sense understanding of the world and so on to justify their decisions. But I, don't, I, I don't agree also, I, 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 let me just qualify. We are surrounded by intelligence systems. From the octopus to the orangutan, from the chicken to whatever, the but ecosystem. They but they don't make decisions for us. They do make decisions around us all the time. So we, we have dealt with intelligent agents for all our existence, and we never once tried to complain that the octopus doesn't know what it means to be human or doesn't answer. If I want to make eggs, I will have 10 chickens they, at home. So, so I'm, not denying, I'm not denying that that's intelligence. But my point is that when, when it comes to these ethical problems and to these social yeah, I'm, problems... I'm trying to get... I'm trying, if you right, let me... Right. So it is... A, now we've invented one more type of intelligence, which is specialized in doing one more thing. Maybe it's not a chicken. But it does one thing very well. Selling books. Um, retrieving doc, Blocking spam. It is uh, uh, naive to expect I can have a conversation with a spam filter. 
So maybe we think that there is to be somewhere else a higher form of intelligence that can converse with us. But if you start building these things, you will realize the automatic sentencing software is not different than a spam filter. The spell checker is not different also. Every single one of them are the same thing. None of them is designed to have any other awareness than their own task. They are quite focused. So the idea of having any conversation with any intelligent machine is just besides the point. This is not what they do unless you make them. And if you make them, you will face a lot of paradoxes because they will tell you after one minute, even humans make decisions without deliberation. And it's only a follow-up process we, we, we do later to rationalize. So but no, no intelligent system that I know of knows why it's making a decision. They don't know why. They just make it to, make, to achieve their goal. But we make this the foundation to regulate the decision making. Well, we don't make it, but the foundation, I mean, the, the design through of the law system. law and through norms and so on. I mean, that's the foundation of it, right? I mean, you go to court in the end. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just, just a moment, Alexis. No, just to make it clear. No, we build the systems to accomplish their goals, and they will accomplish those goals. If you want the system to minimize the reoffending risk rate, maybe it will. If you want to maximize the, the rate of rehabilitation, of, probably it will. Uh, the point is, uh, the one single individual who has been convicted, they will not have even the notion of having a conversation because this is going to be a statistical system. So basically, you're saying everything, everything else that we have to do about the regulation and so on will happen outside the system. Oh, it's just a social debate. That's my point. There will not be a technical solution. People who keep on thinking that there will be a bunch of engineers at Google inventing a new algorithm to fix this are, well, let's say they're deluded. This is not something we fix by engineers and machines. This is something for society and, and a parliament and a discussion. Uh, Alexis was waiting. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, well, I happen to have a PhD in, in automated theory improving, which we mentioned just now. Uh, so I just have a remark. I think that with the advent of machine learning, which brought us some really great things, maybe uh, the importance of automated theory improving is right now a bit undervalued. And I think that it is uh, much more promising uh, than only uh, giving you uh, proofs of mathematical theorems because what uh, mathematical proofs are is that more uh, very often they are actually explanations of a kind so if we intend to make a system sometime which is intended to explain something to a human what you will actually be doing will be automated theorem proving call it a theorem or whatever because explanations are actually proofs I know I know I had this all the time I, I personally don't don't think uh, to I, I have to be honest I don't think it will work, and I don't think it will solve the problem, both. But I heard it. So the idea is, if the machine was only allowed to make its decisions only by logic and not by statistics, then you could open it up, check the trace of the reasoning, and that would allow you to understand why it made a decision, and then you can at least have a sort of fix it. The two problems are that uh, so far, after 50, 60 years of investment, none of the logic-based systems we built is deployed in a way that makes a difference. They are all statistical systems, and there is a reason for that. And the second is that I don't even think the trace of the reasoning would qualify as an explanation in my mind, to be honest. So I don't think that will fix it. But still, we should keep on trying. Uh, well, actually, you have uh, uh, pro theorem provers, which will give you human readable proofs, like in English. Uh, so those can be actually explanations. Yeah, I, wouldn't, I, know you, I know what you mean. I can imagine such a trace. The trace would be, you are a convict for a crime. Should I release you? And then the system would say, well, you've been in a gang. Yeah, your mother left you before you were five. Yeah, your mother was an alcoholic. Therefore, you're high risk. Therefore, you can't leave. That's it. Would you count this as an explanation? I, I think the person is exactly in the same place where he was before. He would say, why can't I leave because my mother left me when I was five? Why? Well, you will answer, the statistics say so.
I, I tell you something really. I can tell you this much because there are so many hands going up, so I don't want to make it long. Uh, but but the idea is, if you, there is an expression in, in English, if all you have is a hammer, then everything else looks like a nail. If you are an engineer, you will see engineering solutions. But these kind of problems, trust me, have been around before engineering. There is a tradition. There is a complete set of scholarship about democracy and responsibility and the law. This is not something for engineers to sit with each other and fix. This is something deeper than that. Yeah, you can move the, you can move the. It's worth making a PhD, I suppose, on that. Anyway, Alexis. Actually, it's not a question. It's just one more remark. The notion of decision. No, uh, and of justified decision, no, because there are also decisions that are taken on, uh, no, on a, let's say, automatic or it is synonymous to responsibility. No, in decision theory, we identify as decision maker the one who, who is responsible for the decision, so who pays the consequences, no, and for whom we model the consequences, no, so. Uh, it is conceivable that we can transfer part of the responsibility of making a decision to an automatic device. No? Uh, actually, it's what we do when we allow Amazon to recommend us a book. No? Because it makes uh, a suggestion, which is a decision, uh, on behalf of some, something. No? So, and the frontiers of how much responsibility we are ready to give up to a machine eh, have been pushed along the time, eh, even before software, uh, for several reasons. And I suppose it will be the case also in the future. The debate of how much we have to take care of what AI is doing today is exactly how much responsibility we are ready to give up uh, towards an automatic device. Yeah, so that's good, the, word, the word is important here. So we are building autonomous systems in the purely, literally Greek meaning of autonomous. So if they are autonomous, who is responsible for their actions? That's the point. I think we, we need to face it at some point. They are you know, self-ruling, they are self-controlling. Uh, if you were controlling them, you would be responsible, but they wouldn't be autonomous. So we have this for automatic cars. That will be a test. We are going to develop that concept there, but it will be transferable to everything else. But organizations already have achieved the status of legal personhood in many countries, and so an organization can be responsible for its actions. So some legal president is there to consider a piece of software as a, a legal person. Whether this is the way to go, I don't know, but obviously, as we build autonomous systems, that question that you're asking must be asked very, very loud.